Hello and welcome. This is David Woodruff. We're going to take a little look here at blood pressure. Some reminders about blood pressure management. You know, so often we are just taking this route and we're not really thinking a lot about the process and what's involved in taking a blood pressure. But as much as we can, as often as we can, we should be trying to get our patients into a good position that's going to optimize our reading of their blood pressure. Now, this doesn't mean that we're trying to optimize their blood pressure, but we're trying to get them into a position where we're going to get the best reading of what their blood pressure could be. If we put their arm up high, if we put their arm down low, if we put their arm underneath them or on top of them, it's going to change the way the blood pressure reads because we're reading pressure in the arm and the arm's relationship to the heart is going to change. So here are some good reminders. We want that patient seated if possible or supine with the head of the bed elevated to about 30 degrees. Feet flat on the floor, legs uncrossed. Okay, so there have been some studies that have shown that if we don't have the, if we have the legs crossed, it's going to alter our blood pressure readings and so on. Well, it kind of makes sense because we're messing with the vasculature when we start compressing it by crossing the legs. Try to lower the noise in a room if we can. Have adequate lighting that you're going to need to be able to read the pressure. Now another, if you're using an automated system, then the adequate lighting piece probably is not as important. We're going to measure the upper arm whenever possible. The further we move from the heart, the more likely it is that underlying pathophysiology is going to affect the readings that we get. So in other words, if I am measuring in their wrist and this person has some significant atherosclerotic disease, it's not as likely to be as accurate. So if I'm really concerned about this patient's blood pressure, first of all, I'm going to measure it in the upper arm, okay, using the brachial artery. Notice as she's doing right here that we're measuring the blood pressure on the left side. So again, that's another characteristic that we'd like to do if possible is to measure the left arm because the left arm is closer to the heart, right? Okay, so we're trying to find out what the pressure is at the heart. Uh, we don't really care what the pressure is in the fingers. We're really concerned about what the pressure is at the heart level because that's going to tell us about what's going on with our hemodynamics and the cardiovascular system as a whole rather than just one peripheral spot. Palpate the brachial artery. Place the cuff, the midline, over the brachial artery. So, you know, we've got the little arrow there on the cuff. We want to make sure that the arrow is lined up on the brachial artery. You know, we so often we don't do this. I, I see it all the time that nurses are putting on blood pressure cuffs and not paying attention to where that cuff is and whether or not it's lined up over the brachial artery. So what happens on that cuff is that there is a bladder inside there that pumps up like a balloon. But that bladder does not fill the entire cuff. You've probably seen this before. Maybe somebody pumped up a cuff by accident or something like that. Or you, you had one of those automated cuffs that fell on the floor and it's still pumping away and blows up like a balloon. And part of it blows up and part of it doesn't. Because the cuff itself, the balloon part, doesn't blow up over the entire thing. So we want to get that centered over the artery so we can get the best reading that we can get. Put that cuff one inch above the antecubital space, so we're not all the way down there squeezing that antecubital space. Wrap the cuff tightly, and then we start to take our measurement. Get the cuff at the level of the heart. Pump the cuff until the radial pulse is lost. Note the pressure, and then start to deflate. Place the stethoscope over the brachial artery. Pump about 20 um, millimeters above the loss of the radial pulse just to make sure that we're going to catch that blood pressure. Slowly deflate. 
Okay, so again, we have that cuff in place. We're, we pumped it up. Now we're slowly de deflating. Here it says about two millimeters of mercury per heartbeat. Okay, that would take quite a while, wouldn't it? So we'd be taking a blood pressure of maybe 30, 40 seconds. In most cases, we're probably not doing it that slowly, but especially when you're listening for the diastolic. Now, keep in mind that the diastolic is when the sound changes character. In many cases, the sound just stops. So those court cough sounds that you're hearing, they'll just stop entirely, and that's your diastolic. But in some cases, you'll hear a diastolic all the way down to zero. When we're checking that blood pressure, then we want to listen for when the sounds change. So they may change character in the way of pitch, loudness, so maybe suddenly they become soft or suddenly they change pitch. So we're going to note that as our diastolic pressure. Our automated blood pressure machines, keep in mind that these things only measure the mean arterial pressure. Okay, so there's no stethoscope on there. There's no nurse listening to it. It's just a cuff hooked around a person's arm and it's blowing up and it's deflating. All right, so it's not giving you exactly the same thing that you're getting from a regular manual sphygmo manometer. It measures the map, so it's measuring the mean arterial pressure, and it's using an algorithm to try and figure out what the systolic and diastolic are. We need to have a regular rate for these machines to be accurate. Because part of how it uses, part of how the calculation it uses is going to be the time between heartbeats to figure out the diastolic. So if we have an irregular time between heartbeats, we're not going to be able to figure out a diastolic. And maybe you've seen this before. You put an automated machine on a patient who has atrial fibrillation and you notice that it won't read and keeps saying error and you have to take a manual one anyway. I've done this before, and I've taken the manual one. I'm like, well, gosh, I mean, it's really easy to hear. I mean, I don't understand why the cuff wouldn't take it. Okay, it's because the machines are looking for a regular spacing of those heartbeats. And when they're not regular, it's going to have a hard time figuring out the systolic and diastolic. Systolic reflects cardiac output. When the heart contracts we get our systolic pressure. So therefore, it's reflecting the cardiac output. Left ventricle contracts, pushes that wave of blood through the vasculature. That's our systolic. So systolic is a direct reflection of your cardiac output. When you're looking at somebody's blood pressure and you say, wow, their systolic has increased today. It went from 120 to 140. What happened is cardiac output increased. Now, if you have a good reason for that, so maybe you say, well, yeah, the patient's up moving around in the hallway now, and the systolic's now 140. Well, that makes sense. There's a good reason for the systolic to increase because cardiac output needed to increase. But if the systolic did, maybe the systolic dropped for no good reason, that's a reflection then of the cardiac output. So think about systolic as a reflection of cardiac output, and then our diastolic is going to be a reflection of the vasculature. So diastolic tells us about what's going on in the vasculature. The more compression we have, see so that vessel lining there, the more vasoconstriction we have, the higher our diastolic will be. Conversely, if we have vasodilation occurring, which happens in sepsis, for example, or maybe you've given the patient a cardiac medication and the diastolic drops, that makes sense. We're trying to cause vasodilation. So if vasodilation occurs, we expect our diastolic to drop. That makes sense. I mentioned before about the mean arterial pressure. We call this our MAP, our mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure is not just a mean or not just an average of what our systolic and diastolic are. Now, there's a reason for this. The reason why it's not just the average is because diastolic time is longer than systolic time. 
So think about what's happening with the heart. The heart contracts. That's pretty quick. But relaxation is longer. It takes a while for that heart to fill. So because of that, we're going to have to use this equation here where we're giving diastolic twice as much consideration as the systolic. So look at our example down here where we have a systolic of 80, a diastolic of 40, so our blood pressure is 80 over 40. We put that into our equation here to figure out what the mean arterial pressure would be. So diastolic times 2 would be 40 times 2, so that's 80 plus 80, divided by 3, and we get 53. So our mean arterial pressure is 53 millimeters of mercury. As you note above, a mean arterial pressure of greater than 60 is what is considered desirable. Now keep in mind that this depends on the patient. So again, looking at our example down here of a systolic of 80, diastolic of 40, that's possible to have in people who are perfectly healthy. So your patients may be a long-distance runner, and they have this phenomenal blood pressure of 80 over 40. That does not mean that they're having ischemia at the tissue level, okay? But if we have a patient who maybe came in with shock, and the patient has a blood pressure of 80 over 40 with a mean and MAP of 53, well, yeah, uh, that indicates that the patient probably is in shock and is not perfusing the way that we would like for them to perfuse. Another thing to think about with our blood pressure is called the pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic. So here we have printed out an arterial line reading. So this is what we see when we look at an arterial line, if we print it out, I should say. So we have a systolic upsweep. We have a dichrotic notch. So you see these over on the right side, the arterial upstroke, dichrotic notch, and then we have the diastolic downsweep. So looking over on the left part there, there's the arrows that are going to the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. And you can see that the difference between these, so if our systolic is 120, diastolic is 80, the difference between these is 40. That would be considered a fairly normal pulse pressure. Now, pulse pressure in and of itself may not tell you a whole lot, but if your patient is starting to decompensate, that's where our pulse pressure really might start to shine a little bit and give us some information. If our patient has tachycardia and their pulse pressure is less than 35, it can indicate a volume deficit. If the patient has tachycardia with a pulse pressure greater than 35, it could indicate sepsis and organ failure. Let's look at that again. So we have tachycardia in our patient, and we have a pulse pressure less than 35. So we have a blood pressure maybe like 100 over 70. With tachycardia, that would indicate a volume deficit. On the other hand, we may have a blood pressure of like 100 over 40. 100 over 40 with tachycardia could indicate the patient's developing sepsis because the pulse pressure is greater than 35. Well, thank you for joining me for this short review here of blood pressures. To find out more and to learn about how you can become certified as a critical care our progressive care nurse, see us online at thenursingprof.com. Thanks again. Until next time, bye now.